Hi folks, today we're talking about viruses, um, but not that kind of virus. What we're actually talking about are types of malware. So we are um, going to run through some of the kinds of um, malware that exists. So usually when we talk about malware, uh, we categorize malware in terms of how it either spreads or what it does. So um, we malware typically does two things. It reproduces itself, so it's replication, it spreads itself across uh, to other machines, uh, and it executes some kind of malicious payload. So it, once it has access to a system, so for example, it's got a program running on a remote system, uh, then it will do something. Um, and so yeah, one of those two ways will, will help us to categorize it. So a virus, in terms of malware, is a program that copies itself into another program. So you've, it spreads itself by basically looking at all the executables that it has access to on the disk, and it um, will just copy itself to within the, the process of another program. Um, it can copy itself into documents if it's a macro virus, uh, or onto boot sectors of removable disks. So back in the olden days when we had the floppy disks, um, how many of you can remember that? Um, you know, we, the, if you left a floppy disk, a uh, diskette plugged into a computer and you booted it up, it would first see, you know, it often would try and boot off the disk. So what a lot of viruses would do, it would put itself into the boot sector so that if you went to someone else's computer and left it plugged into their computer. Um, so obviously this is the oldest kind of malware um, and it's why a lot of software that tries to get rid of malware it just calls itself antivirus software for example even though most of the malware that we're actually interested in aren't actually viruses technically anymore um, that's where the term comes from worms are um, one of the most common kinds of malware and what it does is it copies itself to another computer so this is how it spreads itself so once it is running off on a computer, it will immediately try and send itself to spread onto other computers. Uh, it might do it by sending off emails from your computer uh, or by trying to exploit vulnerabilities on the network. So it'll search for other computers to attack. So there's an automated attack over the network. Uh, but either way, it's spreading from computer to computer. Uh, the Morris worm was one of the first from and it was in 1988 it had no malicious payload it just spread itself uh, over the network via a unix software vulnerability and weak passwords um, and unfortunately it actually reinfected the same computers multiple times which actually caused those computers to be overwhelmed um, with processors and that caused a major disruption to the internet at the time or the, the internet that existed back then um, and um, so another hi historical worm is the blaster worm which spread between Windows XP and Windows 2000 systems um, and it exploited a vulnerability which is a RPC um, DCOM buffer overflow um, vulnerability and the way that they found the vulnerability was by reverse engineering a patch that Microsoft applied so by looking at the patch, the way that Microsoft tried to fix their systems, they were able to actually find the vulnerability, and then they um, designed this worm to produce a, a DDoS, a distributed denial of service attack, uh, on WindowsUpdate.com um, in a particular uh, d date range. Um, it flooded those systems, um, but um, so basically all the systems that had been compromised all started to um, do a DDoS attack. So another category of malicious software is Trojan horses, and they basically are is malware that poses as legitimate software. And sometimes when you run them, it will actually run something that looks benign, but in the background it will be doing something malicious. So for example, um, if you download some software from some dodgy source, so for example, you use BitTorrent to download Photoshop or something, um, you know, there's a chance that the program that you're running 
it maybe it, it does give you Photoshop, but maybe it will also run some uh, Trojan horse uh, in the background to do something malicious. Um, there are lots of different behaviors that Trojan horses can then uh, perform, and one of the most common is a remote access Trojan or a rat, where it will basically allow an attacker to take remote control over that computer. Um, sometimes they're spread via social engineering or man in the middle attacks on your sources of software. So, for example, if you um, go to a website that isn't uh, doesn't have end-to-end, -end, or doesn't sorry, is not uh, have a secure connection, so you're not using HTTPS but just a standard um, plain text HTML, and you go to a website, download some software. Well, someone on the internet might manage to do a man in the middle attack against you and um, basically feed you some um, Trojan horse instead of the um, software that you would have got straight off the website. Um, some history of Trojan horses include things like Netbus and Back Orifice, uh, and there's screenshots on the screen here of those. And, you know, back in the, the day, uh, this is kind of was huge in the 90s. Um, you know, this is what Netbus um, client looked like and so if you um, you know tricked someone into running the server on their computer uh, and the internet was simpler back then as well because um, basically everyone was using public IP addresses so it was before the need for NAT uh, network address translation but basically you could just put their IP address in here um, and which you could find off IRC for example if you're chatting with someone uh, and you could just click a button connect to it and then start you know looking at what's on the screen and what they're typing on the keyboard. You could start a keylogger, um, you, know, you know, basically have full control over their system remotely. Um, and again, you could sort of bundle the server program with a um, something that looks benign, so some little game or something that they run. Um, so that's where XE wrappers come in, so you can basically bundle one program with another, so you could take some malware, attach it to Notepad, for example, send it across when they run it. Oh, okay, you sent me Notepad, but actually they've got some malware running on their computer. A rootkit is malware that hides the process of what's really happening on your computer. So, for example, uh, it will allow you to, well, you will, if you've got some malware that wants to hide itself, it could be a rootkit in that it would change the behavior of the operating system <clears throat> so that when you look at a list of programs, the malware is not listed, for example. Um, and the technical depth that they go to do that uh, depends on the kind of rootkit. Um, <clears throat> but basically, it will make it hard to detect that there is malware on your computer or detect what's actually happening on your computer. <clears throat> Zombies and botnets. Um, so a zombie is a computer that's been infected with malware and it receives commands from remote systems and often it, it acts as a collection of um, zombies known as a botnet. So you've got a, um, a base, basically you've got a bunch of computers that are under uh, the attacker's control. And you often have a command and control server um, and it can either be centralized or you can have a distributed peer-to-peer -peer network using something like Tor, which makes it quite hard to analyze uh, or to disrupt the botnet. Um, if the botnet's designed in a way that um, there's not a single server that you can take down, a lot of the old botnets were taken down by taking down a single server, and then you would take the whole botnet down with it. Uh, nowadays, they're built to be a bit more um, modern in their architecture, so that it's hard to dis harder to, dis to disrupt a botnet. Um, some malware is spyware, which basically spies on the end user. Uh, so, for example, it uses a keylogger to see everything that the user is typing in. And it might collect personal information, including credit card details, payment details um, for like payment attacks. Uh, and it can be used for identity theft. Obviously, if you can steal people's personal information, then you can use it to steal their identity, potentially. Adware is related, but basically it's malware that displays ads to an end user. That's not always malware, so sometimes you might actually sign up to advertising in order to get a free copy of some software, for example. So you wouldn't call that adware, but other times it actually inserts 
um, advertising, um, so some malware will actually insert advertising into your general browsing. So you could be browsing some other website and they're, they're replacing all the ads on that website or inserting additional ads to get some quick revenue from you, for example, or from those companies. Um, and, uh, or it might be like, uh, like inserting advertising uh, pop-ups and things into your offering system itself, for example. Scareware and rogue um, antivirus is actually super common. Um, and I would guess that a lot of you have seen this before. Uh, if you've seen malware before, often it's in the form of um, rogue antivirus software. So it pretends to be antivirus software. Or it might even just be a website that if you're you know, naive enough, you go to some website and it says, we've detected that your computer is infected with malware. Click here to um, you know, uh, fix the problem. And then that's when you actually download the malicious code. And actually sometimes um, you know, you're not actually running any malware until you tell it, yeah, clean up my system, and then actually it installs the malware in your system and does all sorts of um, horrible things. Uh, so it might actually infect your system or just try and trick you. It might tell you that there's thousands of, um, uh, you know, malware on your computer, and actually there isn't any except for itself, and it tricks you into, like, paying money to clean your system up, for example. Ransomware is um, also super common at the moment because it's a way of directly extracting money from the people that have been infected from their computers. So basically it extorts a payment from the end user, from the victim, in order to get access to your computer back. So it's like, well, if you want, your, if you want any of your stuff that's on your computer back, you pay us a certain amount of money. So £50 or something. So Typically, it will lock access to a computer, uh, and it might be as simple as basically just a program that runs when your computer starts, and it just goes full screen and locks your computer and says you can't use it unless you pay up. Uh, but in that case, you could get access to your files just by like pulling your hard drive out of your computer, for example. Um, and it might claim to have detected some illegal activity on your computer, so um, you know. The screenshot there shows some malware that's saying uh, that we've detected um, you doing some viewing forbidden content, uh, pay up or else. Um, and there's actually been cases of people that have committed suicide after receiving these kinds of um, messages. So it has real life ramifications as well. Um, Crypto locker or um, you know encryption based ransomware will go a step further than that and it will actually encrypt your files on your computer so that you actually can't get them back without having the private key. So if it's if the ones that are designed well uses um, public key infrastructure, it uses um, basically um, a um, asymmetric encryption to basically use as a um, one key that's kept on the remote server to the private keys kept on a remote server and that's used to encrypt all of your files using a public key which you cannot decrypt without their private key that they that, that the attackers hold um, and often with ransomware you can actually get access to your data if you pay up but there's a lot of like it by paying up, you're producing an incentive for them to continue the business practice of doing ransomware and spreading ransomware. So if you can avoid it, you shouldn't pay your ransom. And sometimes uh, in the past, there have been um, uh, private keys that have been released. And so there are websites you can go to if you have been infected that will give you tools to decrypt your files. But Sometimes there's just nothing you can do other than rely on the fact that you need to have good backups of, of your files to start with. And, um, you know, it's a decision of, like, whether it's worth paying up the, the ransom in order to get access to your files again. So um, CryptoLocker is an example. It uh, demands payment in Bitcoin, which is semi-anonymous. Um, and the... They, if you look at just the blockchain of Bitcoin, you can see that they received 27 million US dollars in Bitcoin uh, 
and in that case the private keys were recovered when the game over zoo spot net was taken down um, but there's been lots and lots of ransomware since then there's drive by downloads which is where um, unwanted software is basically installed on your system so you visit some software and it automatically triggers a download of some malware and sometimes they do this by um, watering hole attack which is where you put the malware somewhere where you think the victims are going to go so there was an example of Apple uh, employees or going to a specific developer website uh, and there were um, some of them some of their uh, developer systems were um, infected with malware that they got off you know the common website that they visited <clears throat> exploit kits are another kind of malware where um, you have prepackaged malware um, servers that deliver exploits uh, to try and exploit victims browsers and other client software so you have a large number of exploits that target specific browser flaws uh, things like flash java pdf viewers and a whole bunch of other stuff uh, and it when it succeeds it, it installs a malicious payload um, often a zombie that connects to a botnet um, and you know, ex exploit kits are interesting because it, it basically is this like, whole business model uh, and it gives the attackers this like slick interface usually this like web based view of all the systems that have been compromised <clears throat> and malware developers actually sell access to exploit kits uh, including like leases of, and hosting providers and um, some are even like marketed with like marketing marketing um, weird YouTube videos of them talking about how great their exploit kits are and getting you to sign up to um, have access to the exploit kits. You can see here this is an example of the black hole exploit kit and you can see um, on the screen here <clears throat> uh, some like the number of computers that have been um, like attacked uh, and you can see uh, the number of um, operating systems for example that have been compromised and the exploits that had been successful so you can see here there's a Java exploit that most was the most successful uh, for this one but you've also got PDF exploits another Java one it's a flash um, and so you can see that basically it produces this link that it will like usually give uh, the victims when the victims visit it it will bombard their system with a bunch of different attacks and whatever succeeds they um, basically end up getting compromised <clears throat> you can see here mostly in this example Windows 7 systems have been compromised uh, but there's even uh, you know less Linux and Mac systems that are also vulnerable to the vulnerabilities that um, are attacked or the exploits that this exploit kit uses and you can see in here, here a bit more detail of um, the vulnerabilities so banking trojans is another kind of malware that will basically try and attack uh, banking and they'll try and steal your banking information so for example Zeus performs a man in the browser attack which is where it um, changes the way your browser behaves in order to um, <clears throat> give you a false view of the banking website uh, and so that it can drive the banking website to do things that the end user doesn't realize that their computer is doing so it gets around the encryption uh, that's in place between the the victim and the um, bank by basically getting inside the victim's email um, web browser <clears throat> and then it can modify for example bank transactions so that's um, an overview of different kinds of malware uh, that exists and as you can see there's lots of different behaviors that different malware does but basically once it's on your system it does stuff that you don't want it to do um, and there are different ways that it spreads across the um, the network from operating system to operating system system to system from file to file and um, there's lots of things that we need to be aware of <clears throat>